Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our first interview for Sounds on the Couch. I'm really excited to announce this interview with Deborah Hart. Deborah Hart is a counsellor for Act for Music. She's also a musician. Um, she plays the French horn. Um, and she's coming to us today to talk about all things stage fright and performance anxiety. So I'm really excited to announce her. I won't give you any more at the moment because I will pass you on to her and she will be able to explain a lot better than me. So here we go. Hello, Deborah. Hi, Karen. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Well, in order to explain the model, I just want to tell you that my heart's a little bit racing. I noticed that my mouth is a little bit sort of a little bit dry. Um, my mind is saying, oh, my Lord, what am I going to say? Am I going to say something stupid? Is anyone going to turn up? Is anybody going to think it's interesting? Um, but I'm willing to make room for those thoughts and feelings and continue to talk to you and and move towards the things I care about, which is talking about ACT for music performance anxiety. So that's the model that, that I'll start to talk more about but I just wanted to introduce how it works. Yeah, and that's a great introduction because I'm sure so many people that would be watching this would be experiencing so many of the same physical symptoms so much. It's definitely something I've experienced. Um, so I guess let's just start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and your background. So currently I'm an unemployed professional musician because there are not any performances probably at least until 2021 I before we stopped before we shut down I was playing French horn in Shrek in Melbourne which was so much fun um, and I did have some work coming up in the later in the year I I I was um meant to be playing French horn with the Victorian Opera. I was meant to be going to West Australian Symphony Orchestra. Um, that was my bookings coming up, but I'm pretty sure that nothing's going to go ahead for next year. Yeah. But I've, um, I've been doing a lot more counselling, just general counselling, um, people stuck in isolation, some couples and some families. Um, struggling with the circumstances so um, I guess it's it's great for you to be able to share that with people when you're experiencing it firsthand as well sorry which part <laughs> oh the the fact that you're not able to work at the moment with your music uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so I guess um when you're when you're not working with your music and you're not working with your counselling, who is who is Deborah Hart? Um, I've got a beautiful family. I've got a husband mm -hmm. and two daughters, twenty something, twenty one and nineteen. And I like to walk. Um, I like to watch Scandi Noir. Crime shows in Scandinavian. Um, I read a lot of. I try to read a lot of uh, therapy books, um, research on uh, on performance anxiety. Um, I knit. I vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> I scrub the walls. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Um, <laughs> So what, what led you, I guess, for your musical journey, what led you to start playing the French horn? Um, well, in high school I was already playing the cornet so I, or the trumpet. So I had play, I'd start, I'd started playing the cornet in a brass band when I was 10 years old. And before that I really wanted I don't know I remember sort of begging my mother for piano lessons um, 
but it wasn't a part of our culture, our family, um, to have music lessons. So um, when the band advertised for new members and it was free and it was literally at the end of the street, um, my parents were okay with that. So I joined the band and I just loved being in the band. I loved the sense of community. I loved that the music was challenging but not too challenging, that I didn't really have to practice most of the time. You just sort of turn up and you learn together and you learn as a group and then you go out and do concerts and competitions and just that lovely sense of community that I, I didn't really have anywhere else. My parents weren't churchgoers. We didn't have a big family. Um, so being in the band was was my home, was my spiritual home. And when I got to high school, um, it was a public girls' school in the western suburbs of Sydney. Um, there wasn't much music happening, but in year eight, so the second year of high school, we had this wonderful woman turn up, an American woman named Debbie, Deborah Dietz, <laughs> and she played the French horn. And... Um, I remember I didn't actually change to French horn till I was about 16 and started learning from her. And um, yeah, she was she was a great a great horn teacher, she, great music teacher. She got me into a lot of um, uh, public education music programs um, uh, that that don't seem to exist in Victoria. There's a much greater uh, Victorian. Um, uh, New South Wales public music education system, music camps. Uh, I used to play at the Opera House a couple of yeah. times a year. Um, and then I thought I'd become a music teacher, but I was encouraged to pursue professional horn playing. Um, okay. When my, my teacher in about the second year at uni, no, maybe first year at uni, got really angry with me and said... Um, why don't you practice? Why, why aren't you doing any of this practice that I'm telling you to do? <laughs> and and I said, oh, you know, oh, I don't know. And he said, you know that you quite, you know, if you practiced, you could become a professional. No, I think he said, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, oh, I'd really love to be a professional musician, but, you know, I'm not good enough. And he said, of course you're good enough. You know, just one of those little moments in your life, you just go, oh, Okay. Of yeah. course, that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't think I'd be good enough. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Wow. So I guess, you know, when you had that sense of community and you had, you know, all that ability, where did your journey of stage fright come from? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, well, you know, way back when I was 10 years old, I remember going in my first competition and, and, I remember standing there thinking I was going to fall over because my knees were just shaking so much. So the physical symptoms, but also was the quality of my playing. It basically, you know, disappeared. All the things that I practiced, all the ability that I had in the practice room just disappeared. So, but it wasn't really an issue I think I, I did pretty well, actually, most of my teenage years because it, being in the band, you, you're doing a lot of solo playing. You, you go into competitions, you, you, um, you're playing and performing all the time. And at school, you're performing all the time. And even at the conservatorium, so I went to the Sydney Conservatorium, even there, you're performing all the time. And it's not really an issue, until for me at least, until I want, and I, until I started to do professional auditions, okay. and actually that same horn teacher, he uh, he encouraged me to do these auditions, and sort of assumed that I would get one, get one of the jobs, but I would walk in and just completely fall apart. Yeah. So I would, you know, my fingers would fumble, my there was I, I couldn't play the right notes. I would get lost. I would just like stare like a deer in headlights. 
And again, the quality of my playing was not... Mm. I can see myself in the screen. So my quality of my playing was was here <laughs> and when I'd go into a audition, it was, you know, uh, under the screen. Terrible. Yeah. Embarrassing. And, you know, that's the that's the problem too is that not only did you play well, play badly, but you feel so ashamed that you played badly. And that's when it sort of starts to snowball is the, the memory of the shame and then the anticipation of another audition, which sort of the, the anticipation is worse and the shame is worse and then you, yeah. Okay, so from, from, from that point where you're experiencing, um, where you know you're at this, this kind of level and you, um, you're performing at a different kind of level, how did you get from that point to working with people to help them to manage stage fright themselves? Well, that's, a, that's a very long road because that was, um, that's almost 30, a 30-year 30 road journey or journey cliche okay. um so really well i suppose even 25 years ago 25 or 30 years ago i was already thinking i was always already looking into the research about what's helpful to musicians and there were a couple of books around um there was a little bit tiny bit of research about but it didn't really sort of I mean there was some helpful stuff I mean really basically practicing so if you practice and you're especially in classical music that you can play what you need to play almost automatically so it almost is a conditioned response that it it just comes out so you've listened to the music, you've um, uh, you've practiced it a lot. You're very, you know, fluid with it. And then you sort of, even before I started doing this work, basically you ex it's called exposure therapy. So you basically are exposing yourself to the situation. So you do it in steps. So. Um, you know, you run up and down some steps to get your heart racing and then play the piece, for instance. So you're getting used to it. So that was before I discovered ACT and things like that. So that was really helpful just having those skills before I discovered this stuff. But about 10 years ago, I went to a psychologist because of, I suppose, general mental ill health. I was in a job that I wasn't happy with and this, the work situation was not very healthy, I felt, and I was really struggling probably with sort of a PTSD or depression or anxiety or, you know, some sort of general malaise. And I went to see this psychologist and at the time I had been working really hard at practising and auditioning and trying to get out of that job basically, trying to get another job. And so I'd been working really hard, what I thought, mentally on processes that were around at the time. And one of the first things she said to me in the session was, you know that you don't control your thoughts, don't you? Or you can't. Or, you know, it's not your fault that you have these negative thoughts. And to me that was, that was the light bulb moment. Um, and I immediately thought this would be helpful to musicians to know that it's not their fault that when you when you walk towards something that you care about and that you love this stuff happens inside of you the thoughts the sensations the urges the behaviors that it's not your fault that that this happens yeah that's so powerful i think that's, that's there will be people that listen to this that definitely that's that, their life alone as yeah. well. So, yeah, it is really powerful. So from, I'll just finish off, because from then on I sort of gradually, well, I got, I had to get sort of mentally better. So I took three years off playing and then in a, in a with the purpose of trying to um, 
see if ACT could be used with music performance, I started playing again. And then I, um, you know, did some auditions. I worked professionally again. Um, and then I sort of, yeah, and then I became a counsellor and here we are. Fantastic. So um, ACT for Music in itself, would you be able to take us through what they do with their clients or what you would do generally with your clients through ACT for Music? Um, okay, so there's three parts to the process. Aware, allow and act. So do it. Okay. So being aware, first off, is aware of what your mind is doing, what your body is doing, um, how you're playing, how you're sounding. So just a, building a, a skill of paying attention. But also another part of that aware is aware of who you want to be. How, how do you want to play? How do you want to sound? And how does music serve your life? What is it about music that will serve your greater purpose? The second part is allow. And allowing is sort of realising what is under your control and sort of sorting out. So for me, it was allowing a dry mouth or allowing um, shaking or allowing the urge to run off stage and not do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, allowing all the thoughts, I'm not good enough, I can't do this. Um, everybody's watching me and criticising me. So building a sort of a willingness that this discomfort comes with the territory. Yeah. Um, my supervisor, his favourite phrase is, this is the ticket that you buy to becoming a musician. This is the cost. This is the price of being a musician, is these feelings, these thoughts, these urges. Mm. And the third part is the acting. It's because act, acceptance and commitment therapy is a, is a behavioural therapy. So it's asking you to behave as if you were the person that you want to be. So if I want to be a great colleague, if I want to be a good colleague for, my, for people I work with, what would a colleague, how would a colleague behave? Well, a colleague would be brave and because and, I'm thinking about when I'm playing first horn in a horn section. How would a colleague that I admire, how would they behave? How would they perform? Um, would they back off from playing that particular phrase loudly and without conviction? Um, and there's a... There's a there's a really helpful part of the acting part. Uh, it's, it's actually a really good word, acting, because you almost are acting as the person that you want to be. And a really helpful part of the acting part is how can I offer my music to other people? How can my music, what, what am I trying to communicate? What am I trying to give people? Rather than it all being about me, and me being fabulous and me getting the job and me um, being perfect. Yeah. So that's sort of act in a nutshell for music. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. And I guess when you're talking about that um, aspect where you are, um, sorry, I'm getting a bit of an echo, so I'm a little bit delayed. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Um, when, when you do say where well, you're taking the focus off yourself, um, I think so many people who have struggled with stage fright have heard that so many times as well. But then to actually put that into practice, what would you recommend to people 
to actually start to do that. Um, okay. So um, I've, I've actually run a, a two-week mindfulness course a couple of weeks ago, and that's the first step. So building mindfulness skills in order to serve music, not so that you'll be more peaceful or that you have some sort of transcendent experience, but to build the mental skills to be able to turn your attention away from what is screaming at you because I think that's an interesting part is that, and that's a part of the acceptance part, is that as we move towards this performance, your body starts screaming at you to run because especially if you've experienced performance anxiety before, you perceive the stage as dangerous. Your body memory that you can't get rid of will perceive the situation as dangerous and your body is trying to, your body and your brain is trying to look after you. So that's the first part is, is noticing, like I said before, noticing the urges, noticing the distracting symptoms that are telling you to get out of there. Mm. Or this is dangerous. And that takes practice. Yeah. That, I mean, I, I did Les Miserables for six months when I started practicing this stuff. Yeah. And so I did eight shows a week. And it's really difficult to practice this stuff because even though cognitively I knew how it worked my body just I'll just explain there's a at the beginning of Les Miserables there's a really fantastic um uh I think it's the end of the day isn't it, it starts but it's a really rollicking good start it's so much fun the beginning and the second bit of Les Mis is um I dreamed a dream yeah so all of that noise and all of that sort of, oh, this is so much fun, and then it just stops, and then it's just, and, the, and it's silent, and she starts singing, and you have got this tiny little horn solo that everybody's listening to because most people aren't playing. You're the only person playing, and it's this beautiful moment that you don't want to ruin with your split note. And every night I just got to watch my mind doing it. And, you know, my heart was racing. I was, I had the urge to run out. I had thoughts of I'm going to screw it up. I've got to be perfect, um, you know. So, my, so to answer your question <laughs> half an hour ago, um, this, is, this is how it works, but it's not easy and it, takes a lot of practice yeah that we build the skill of noticing the urges and choosing a behavior did that answer your question yeah absolutely that was great <laughs> i guess as well along those lines how has your approach changed since you started working in that capacity so obviously you had you had the fear originally and then you were working through that process how do you approach things differently now when you go and play music when you're feeling those feelings well what i've gotten better at and what what i've found is a really helpful process that is now a whole sort of world of therapy on its own it's called compassion and even over the last 10 years as I've started to do this work, developing my own compassion for myself yeah. because I think I was, well, I was very hard on myself, very, um, I set high standards for myself that weren't particularly healthy and would beat myself up 
when I wasn't perfect. Even, you know, even when I started doing the therapy. And it's a sort of, again, it's a normal response. This sort of, that voice is, is also trying to protect you. It's mm -hmm. trying to say, watch out. You know, you've got to be good. So developing this sort of internal kindness. So when you notice you speaking to yourself like that, to be able to respond to yourself with genuine kindness, that it's okay. It's okay. You're doing your best. And even in that moment where you're about to play something and you're terrified that you're going to screw it up, if you can develop, if you can bring that voice into that moment. Um, and I experienced that a couple of years ago. Uh, I was on tour in China with Western Australian Symphony Orchestra and I just met this wonderful woman and she was playing second horn to me and she is a very kind person. And I'd never worked with her before so I hadn't really experienced what it was like to work with her. And I had some little solos in, you know, it was a big concert in China. And, and she said to me, you've got this. Yeah. And that's my voice, you know, yeah. when I'm struggling and when I think I'm going to screw something up. And there's a lot of science around anxiety and compassion and the anxiety, the sort of agitation and the sort of the distress and the soothing capacity of kindness. And if you can give, if you can notice your anxiety and soothe it, it actually lowers your anxiety. Yeah. So, so if you can develop that kind voice in yourself, it, it's actually quite magical. Not easy, yeah. Yeah. but quite magical. Interesting. So why why do you think that so many uh, that some people seem to struggle more with performance anxiety than others? How long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the work that I've done in the last couple of years has been interesting uh, for me. Um, because I am a musician as well as a counsellor. So I, when I work with clients, they sometimes play in the sessions. And, of course, while I try to switch off my musician brain, mm -hmm. it's really hard not to notice. So when yeah. people have expectations of what they want their music to be or what they want to get from their performance i've i've noticed a lot of people are out of touch with either expectations of mm -hmm. professional music or out of touch with how they actually whether they're ticking the boxes that they need to tick so that's okay. the, what i've noticed is a huge part especially in professional music yeah. is that understanding of what's expected of a professional musician in terms of, you know, accuracy, intonation, the right notes in the right place, that, that a lot of people don't seem to know mm. what the expectations are. So if you have somebody who is a performer at the moment and they feel like they're listening to this and they say, oh, maybe I'm one of those people, yep. where can they go to set their expectations right or find out how the expectations should be? Well, that's in, in, our, in our classical music tradition, that's sort of the job of their teacher. But... I don't, I'm wondering if people can hear it. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really know what the answer is. Yeah. What One thing is, is that they can record themselves. And this is something else that people aren't, that I've noticed in my work with people, 
is a real resistance to actually recording themselves and li listening back. <laughs> and, you know, we have these devices now that I didn't have and I would have died for, you know, to have the ability to, you know, I had a, a tape deck with a cassette in it that I could, you know, so I suppose relatively I was lucky or, you know, a Walkman that you could record yourself with. But you've got these wonderful high-quality devices that you can just put on your music stand and press record and watch yourself. And also educate yourself, especially in classical music, to what is a good musician? What, what does it sound like? What does, what is, what's the difference between me and them? These yeah. people who are successful, if, if that's what you care about, if yeah. you want to tick those boxes and get that job, being able to go, oh, okay, they played that like this and when I play it, it sounds like this. And being able to articulate and yeah. discern and and describe the differences is people really struggle with that. Yeah. I guess, though, as well, where's the line between looking at what other people are doing and comparisonitis, so starting to over-assess what other people are doing? Well, I suppose I would ask... Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very common sort of metaphor we use. It's not, it's not the thing. It's your relationship to the thing. So comparison. Why are you comparing people? Why are you comparing yourself with that person? Is it to get information? And are you holding that information lightly and gently? Or am I, am I using that information to beat myself up with? So I see, you know, that that person has this, uh, so they're playing that scale and you can hear every note beautifully. You know, every note is, you know, oh, that sounds really lovely when they do that. Maybe that's what I want to do too. And you can start with, again, with the kindness and with the awareness Start walking in that direction, but not beating yourself up with, I will never get there, they are so much better than me, I'm a piece of crap. You know, it, it, it's, it's how you hold that information yeah. and how you use that information. And I suppose the question is, why are you comparing yourself with somebody else? What's your yeah. intention? Is it to beat yourself up? Is, to, is it to make yourself feel bad? Or is it, is it in order to learn something yeah. and to, to see what you can learn and see if it will help you move towards what you care about? Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so uh, next question. Uh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, do you think it's sort of in our nature to be fearful in this kind of way or do you think it's a learnt behaviour? Do you think that naturally if we didn't have any society input that that we would just be really confident and be able to get there and perform or do you think that it's, it's a nature type thing? A couple of things. Um, we are social animals. We, ca we cannot survive well. Technically you could now. You know, you could live in your apartment and you could Uber Eats and you could, you know, never go out of your apartment. So you could technically, you know, not see another person. But in reality, there are people doing those things for you. So we are social animals. We can't survive alone. We need each other and we're wired to depend on each other. And... Um, there's a one of my favorite phrases is a lone monkey is a dead monkey. So we are wired to care what other people think of us. And that's another that's another acceptance piece. Is that no matter how much I don't want to care about what the audition panel thinks of me or what the people listening to this broadcast are, <laughs> you know, I can't switch that off. Yeah. And so I need to sort of be willing to step into that, that I care what people think. 
What was the other part of your question? Um, just whether it's nature, whether, you know, are we learned, do we learn this behaviour by society and the way that we grow up? So the other part of it is about music and that music um, functions, uh, you know, prehistorically, music functions. Well, I often say in workshops, you know, our first experience of music is a baby in our arms and the baby making noises and the mother copying those noises. And I've got a beautiful little clip of a baby um, copying the, well, no, it's the, the grandmother copying the, what the baby says and then it just sort of in this lovely loop. And there's yeah. oxytocin. So there's a bonding chemical that's, that's set off when we're, you know, uh, making music together. Yeah. And there's another aspect of it, the sort of choral aspect. So singing with people, making music together, our hearts start to beat together, we breathe together. And again, more of the hormones, probably oxytocin. Um, so music functions to join us together and to work together. Yeah. But what happens when we stand up in front of other people on our mm -hmm. own? It's a completely normal response to feel stage fright, yeah. to feel anxiety, because if they don't like us, and this is what our wiring is telling us, if they don't like us, they will kick us out and we will die. Mm -hmm. And as we get older and we and we stand up and in front of other people and we have this experience that's unpleasant, this the physiological and emotional response to standing in front of other people, every time we do it, it, it sort of escalates. I mean, you know, some people don't have that, but mainly it's a human response to respond in this way. And the more you give into it and run away from it and the more it sort of, the more you believe it's ruined your performance, the more, again, the more tightly we holding we don't want to have that experience yeah and it makes it worse so yeah. it's a completely normal response is my answer yeah and so you would believe that the majority of us at some stage would be experiencing this yeah, yeah. excellent um so what can i sorry can i just add one one bit <laughs> And, and the more you invest in music and music performance and the more that you're, the more that you want it, the more that you're self-identified as a singer or as a musician or the more that you've, the more skin in the game you've got, of course, the worse it is because you've got so much depending on that note, on that making sure you get that and making sure you don't ruin that. And the more you care about it and the more you love it and the more you want it, it's all tied in together. And the, yeah. our, the guy that wrote, the guy that mainly started ACT, Stephen Hayes, the more, his quote is, uh, the more we hurt where, I'll start again, we hurt where we care. Yeah. So if we care, it will hurt. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is, from your experience, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that um, you've seen people that struggle with stage fright have? There's a, there's a couple of people out there advertising um, their services for this, for performance anxiety. And... They use words like um, bulletproof and um, I don't know. I can, now I can't remember the other words that I was thinking of. They talk about winning and um, uh, now I can't remember the words. But that sort of idea that 
I've got to be really strong. Like I'm going to master my nerves. I'm going to get rid of this thing that I don't like. Um, get get rid of your anxiety. Those sort of, I think, uh, I think they're very counterproductive. And, you know, that's where I was before I came to ACT is that there's something wrong with me because I can't get strong enough or I can't stay centred enough or I can't, um, I'm still having these thoughts of I'm not good enough. Or So I yeah. think I think that sort of stuff is dangerous, that you can become uh, indestructible mm -hmm. through your own um, uh, efforts. Yeah. And I think those ideas are an unhelpful misconception, for instance. Yeah. Where do you think we learn those ideas from? Um, Putting you on the spot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's cultural, toughen up, be a man. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, there is something helpful about that stuff, you know, when you've got to get through something that's, you know, that's going to kill you and, you know, you have to get to the other side of the moat and to get away from the crocodile. There is something helpful about toughen up, keep on going. But I would say that in the performance of music, sometimes it's not helpful to have these preconceived ideas that that we will become bulletproof, that we will become um, ironclad uh, tough by some sort of process that people are selling. Why do you why do you think that so many of so many musicians that do struggle from these fears continue to play music year after year even though they're struggling so much? Well, in my case, it was my profession and I had a job and I had a mortgage and I, um, I, I was a musician, you know. I am a musician. I, this is what I do. It's your identity. My, it was my identity. Yeah. And my ego. Yeah. And so that's why. But but it's 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 also it's much more than that. I mean, in my ego, in my you know all of that stuff. But I really did love playing music. Yeah. And I, I really, I really struggled to find that most of the time. But there were moments in the last thirty years where it was absolute bliss. So it's like these tiny, tiny moments of bliss, maybe they're worth it. Maybe yeah. the struggle mm -hmm. is worth it for these tiny little moments of, you know, absolute sense of flow and transcendence that we experience. Yeah. And I think that's what people, that's what keeps people struggle, um, keeps people walking through the struggle. Yeah. Is, is those moments of ecstasy almost and I would say yeah. connection with others yeah fantastic um, so what if we have a look at sort of our society both the culture of music and the culture of Australia what kind of changes do you think we need to support musicians more in terms of stage fright and performance anxiety well, what I'm doing right now is an attempt to support musicians. Um, being in a part of being a part of the ACT community, so this community where just the therapeutic stance. So, even with your therapist, your therapist will say, "Yep, yeah, I'm struggling with the same thing that you are," and that beautiful validation that there's nothing wrong with your client. Your client is struggling with the same things that you are. And I've been to a lot of conferences. I've had a lot of supervision. I've, I've had a lot of therapy. And the idea that I'm no better than you. So I, I'm very open 
about talking about this as much as I can. I mean, sometimes I don't talk about it because I am struggling and I've just got to get through it. So I just, I, you know, I shut down and I focus on what I have to do and I'm, I don't tell everybody that I'm struggling while I'm struggling. You know, if I've got a performance and I'm worried about something, I will basically stay focused on and I won't, uh, you know, uh, tell everyone about it. Yeah. But I will be quite open after the event that that was hard and what was hard about it and, you know, what came up for me and how I dealt with it. So that's yeah. one thing, that we can be open about how difficult this is. I mean, if we could teach mindfulness skills in primary school and there is a, you know, there's a huge movement that is trying to, that knows the benefit of mindfulness skills, not in a sort of... Um, you know, a hippy dippy way, but a real sort of teaching concentration skills, teaching focusing skills, teaching compassion skills. Yeah. That would be a start. And then building it into training for musicians. Yeah. Fantastic. So, what would you say right now if there's somebody watching this who is on the brink of giving up? They've, um, they love their music, but they're They've experiencing that fear and the bodily um, reactions to that fear. What would you say to them right now? Would it be too outrageous to say, "Have a break, <laughs> put it away, um, and see what that's like. Put it down and maybe stop struggling with it for a while." And uh, notice when you put it down, when you put it away. I mean, to be quite frank, I'm, my life is quite fine without music. I mean, I don't practice my horn. I don't, I don't feel like I'm missing. I do miss Shrek a little bit. That was a really fun show, must admit. And I get a bit nostalgic about that. But I gave up for three years. I gave up in, in the past. I've stopped playing when I had babies, I didn't play. I mean, it's quite it's quite nice to stop putting that, you know, having the struggle. Um, and I'd ask sort of, well, you know, that's therapy though, isn't it? Um, would it be okay just to put it down for a while? Yeah. So when, when you've had your breaks and you've come back, has, have you felt like it's been different when you've come back? Yeah. 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 Actually, my husband has a good phrase. Let me see if I can remember it. I think he says something like, um, when you put it away for a while, you forget your bad habits. Yeah. And That's then you can, you can just sort of start afresh. And, but I would, you know, if I was working with someone, I would really clearly um, help them articulate why they're picking it up again and be very clear about who they want to be when they're picking it up again and, and sort of sort out what's under your control. Because a lot of the time people come to me when they, just before an audition, and they come and they... Um, they want to get the job and you sort of have to ask, well, is, is it under your control what they think of you, whether they're going to give you the job or not? And being able to sort of tease out what is under your control and what isn't and being able to let go of you don't know whether they're going to give you the job or not. You can't control yeah. that. And so who are you going to be? with that knowledge. Okay. Fantastic. Is there anything else at the moment that you'd like to share with people about performance anxiety or about anything that you do? Mm, no. No. <laughs> That's okay. Well, you've given us so much information. It's been absolutely incredible. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. 
It's absolutely my privilege and I'm, I, as you can see, I could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's a good thing. <laughs> I've thought about all of this stuff. Uh, well, I've thought about this for mm, nearly 50 years. Yeah. You know, why, why can I do it here but I can't do it here? It's, to yeah. me, that's the central question. Why? And how can I fix it? And I feel so, like I have an answer. Okay. So what do you feel came out of that questioning? Oh, well, I suppose it's all the stuff that we've just been talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but um, because I'm a human being and because yeah. I care yeah. okay. and... And because, because my mind and my body isn't under the control that I think it's under control, under the control I think it's under. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we, we sort of put people on pedestals when we think that they've got it under control. Yeah. But we don't know what's going on in their head. We don't, you know, we don't know. So we, so we, I mean, I don't know if it's the same for you in, in your field of music, but in our field, we, you know, we, <laughs> we will, you know, make Facebook comments, nailed it, you know. Um, uh, I can't remember another word, but that sort of, you know, you, you didn't make a single mistake and people will put, put people up on this pedestal, you know. Because it is pretty amazing that yeah. you didn't make a mistake. That's fantastic. But it's this sort of idolisation of people and then the expectation that you put on yourself wanting to be like that person. Yeah. 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 No, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to end it here. If anybody has any questions, you can contact me and um, we can try and get them answered if Deborah's able to help us out. So, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. My pleasure. See you soon.